Well, back in about 62, a friend of mine called and said, Wally, do you want to be an astronaut? I said, yes, of course. I said, okay, get a hold of Dr. Loveless. So I wrote to him, called him. He communicated back, be here in two weeks on a Monday. I will start your tests. Then I was at that time a, uh, a flight instructor for the Army at Fort Sill. And I had to drive home to Taos, New Mexico, which is my hometown. And uh, with my parents, they drove me to Albuquerque, which is about three hours away. And they had to sign me in to the front desk at the Loveless Clinic so that I could take those tests. And I was underage. And that didn't bother me a bit. I said, well, I'll, I'll do that. No big deal. Mm-hmm. So then we started. Started, started tests. There were like over 120 different tests. And some of the front ones were, we want your urine. We want everything about you. They stuck tubes up me to, to test whatever organ was had. I had to swallow tubes that went somewhere that tested me. They wanted to know everything about your body. And so the, one of the first tests I remember was I was strapped in a chair and they stuck a needle in my ear, or not a needle, but a, a vice that had water in it that was 10 degrees. And that kind of gave you a little bit of a shock. Oh, my word. I don't think I said anything, but oh. And then that, that went by because I was taught never to say anything good, bad, or anything about whatever's happening to me because I've never really had anything happen to me. Okay, so I was surprised at that because they hadn't, They hadn't told me, and uh, people had faded and fallen off the chair and so forth. I just sat there. Then they took that out. Then I went into another room for an hour, came back when it was time, and then they put the 10-degree water in my left ear. And I said, oh, my word. And that was that, and I went through that test. So the whole week was testing my body. Oh, they want to know how much radiation I had. They want to know all the the x-rays that they could take of my whole body, every tooth, every foot, every, every tune, everything. Before that, I was flying. So, of course, flying my Stearman, which is a, a four-wing aircraft, I could do a lot of 360s and loops and so forth, helped teach me what I can do mentally and physically for these tests. So flying my steerman was very apropos. And also how my parents taught me were so fabulous. They wanted me to do anything I wanted to do. I was kind of a free spirit in my own life. Um, also, I was, was brought up on opera. And when Operas came, I would do pots and pans on the table, and I'd bang them, and I would direct the opera, and in my own way, watching it on TV, and that was one of my big loves. So I had two loves. Some of the questions, the psychological questions that that they asked me in in Loveless were all all about me and and what I did and what, what could I do, and I said, I can do anything. And then somebody said, uh, what do you know about opera? I said, well, quite a bit. said, who wrote uh, uh, Nambuco? I said, Verdi. Well, they were so shocked, they stopped the questions because I knew my operas. Many, many tests, but I think one of the most interesting tests to you all would be I was placed in a great big tank that was uh, in a oh a large, large room. And I got into the tank. Well, at first, when I was going through the door, there was a clock on the door. And I saw that I was going in about 8.30 in that morning. So I thought, boy, when I get out, I want to look at that clock. I got to the area, dropped my towel, got under the steps, went down into the water, and... I got in the water and I had just enough foam rubber about that big under the back of my neck and the back of my back to stay afloat in a spread eagle position. 
And that's the way I was supposed to stay the whole time I was there. So I get into that position and uh, what's wrong here? I banged on the water. Couldn't feel it. Banged on my face. Couldn't feel the water. I tasted it. Couldn't taste it. What had they done? The temperature, the humidity, everything was my same temperature because they had taken my temperature forever on all these tests. So this test in the tank was to see how I was going to do. Some people didn't even make it an hour. Uh, Later on, it's dark. You can't see anything. And all I could do is turn off my brain and go on up to the heaven and know that I was being watched and knew that I was going to be okay. I had, when I was born and raised in Taos, New Mexico, the Pueblo Indians taught me how to look to the Taos mountain, which is the spirit of the mountain, and always look at that spirit so that I knew what to do. And I still look to that spirit every day in photographs. Okay. Then I'm laying there. Pretty soon I hear a voice come on and they say, Wally, do you have to go to the bathroom? I said, no, I already did that. So, okay, bye. Then another voice comes on, long time. I think I might have fallen asleep one or two times, just very quickly. And then they came on and said, Wally, we want you to get, get the towel on you. Be careful getting out of the pool. A lot of people couldn't make it, I understand. They hadn't stayed in as long as I had. And I got out, and where did I want to go? I wanted to go out that door and look at that clock. And so when I went out the door and turned around and looked at it, they had covered it up. Well, I had to go through a lot of psychological questioning and some more tests. And then the doctor said, Wally, you broke a record. You stayed in 10 hours and 35 minutes. And that, that to me was, okay, great. I was, I was happy with that, but I didn't realize that a lot of people had, had, had even come close. So that's one of the tests. And then there was another a centrifuge test where I was put in a vehicle and they wanted to see how my brain, if, if I'd let all the blood and, and everything drain out of my brain. Well, being an acrobatic pilot, I knew better. So when the, we're going around, round, round, and I got up to about five Gs, five and a half Gs, I was perfectly normal. I could do whatever they wanted me to do. They wanted me to push out a blue light, a green light, or whatever. I could do it. Then the, the test stopped after a while, and they said, well, you did exceptionally well going five and a half Gs when some of the guys couldn't even do that themselves because they hadn't done all the exercises that I had done in the steerman, even in their jets. It was a lot of straight and level flying. I listened to the spirit of that Taos Mountain. I knew what I wanted to do. Since I took those tests with Loveless, yes, I wanted to go into space. I thought that would be great. Moon and Mars didn't even exist. Later on in my life, I knew I wanted to go up to International Space Station, ISS. When I tried to apply to NASA, they said, Wally, you don't have an engineering degree. I said, well, one of the other astronauts doesn't have one either. Oh, but he's flown jets. Oh, well, okay. Uh, I tried to get an engineering degree, so I went to a place where I was living in um, Ohio, and they, they, he thumped me on the shoulder, and he said, you're a girl. Go to home ec. Well, my grandfather had said, if a person ever is not nice to you or touches you in any way, you turn around and walk out. And that's exactly what I did at that time. Because in the 60s, it was very hard for girls to do anything. Hidden figures. I've seen it three times. What those women knew in those times, in the 60s, and could put up on the bulletin board or on the blackboard were fabulous. But look what they had to put up with. The 60s were terrible. But I still made it to everything I wanted to go. After the tests were canceled, which everybody says, was I disappointed? Well, yeah, sure. But 
It didn't ruin my life. Nothing has ever bugged me. I have done everything the way I want to do it correctly. Never had a problem. Never had an accident. None of my students have had an accident. In flying, I've over 19,500 flight hours, which is more than most captains have. I knew that I would go on because I went to, I, I wasn't even disappointed. I knew I had, I knew that Taos Mountain taught me. You have to continue going on. I went to different colleges, different medical places to keep getting more and more tests so that I could make what it takes to go. And I proved that. Uh, I, I knew the girls, uh, Eileen Collins, uh, Sally Ride, I, I knew all of them as they were going up. So that's how I met them when I went to NASA. But I... Uh, didn't know anybody that was starting to do it as, as, as much as I wanted to. And of course I wanted to go up to international space station so bad. And right now I think it costs $35 million to go up there. <laughs> uh, I'm ready. I'm ready to go up tomorrow. Right after the, uh, they stopped with the, um, space stuff. I said to my parents, I want to go overseas. I want to get a Volkswagen camper. I'm going to get it in Brussels. And I'm going to fly over from New York. Mother sewed a $1,000 bill in my underpants just in case. Father gave me the checks that I would need for money because I found that Taos is a great colony for artists that came from Europe. And they, they knew my father quite well. When this happened, I was and, and told them that I was going overseas and to Europe and wherever I could go. I got invitations to go to people's homes to meet next to kin. And one was in Switzerland, was a colonel. And I got to go there. And it's just the whole world opened up for me. I was never in any problem. I was in 59 countries, all of Europe, the Mideast, which you can't get to today. Then I went on. I got a boat that goes from uh, Israel and over to the uh, top part of um, Africa. And I took my time driving across Africa. Then I stayed in Morocco for about a month or so. And then I had such a great time there. And I thought, okay, I got to get down to the south part of Africa. I had to go back to Gibraltar, get the uh, car on the boat, and go down all the way around Africa and get off of the Renko Marcus. And that was right at the top part of uh, South Africa. And that was fabulous. That took, uh, oh God, weeks. And then my first tour was going to uh, a, a park where I met a lot of animals that I loved, Kruger National Park. And I could drive myself in there. I had freedom. People don't have freedom in Kruger anymore. And I, I've ridden all kinds of animals, whether it was an elephant, a giraffe, uh, an alligator, uh, any kind of animal that was around. Or I walked underneath where lions were feeding and sleeping underneath a tree. Didn't bother me a bit. I, never, I was never harmed by any kind of an animal. And I just, Loved being in South Africa. So I stayed down there two or three months, way down to the Cape, and stayed with people that I knew, and they had invited me. And then I made my way up to uh, Lorenco Marcos again, and then found out that I had to take a boat around up to Kenya and uh, met more people there that my parents knew. So I had a wonderful trip. So I was gone for a long time. Mother said, when are you going to come home? I said, I don't know, Mother. I've gone to 59 countries. It might be another half a year. <laughs> it had already been about two and a half years. When I'm speaking to kids in junior high and high school kids, I talk about STEM and what they can do. A lot of people in Texas don't teach their kids what they can do and achieve. I could achieve anything. I've built homes. I've fixed airplanes. I've changed tires. I, uh, I've done everything. I haven't. The one thing mother said, do you want to learn how to cook, honey? I said, no. And I don't want to go to a grocery store either.
and I never have. And then that's what I speak about to the kids. They can do anything they want to do. Have you ever thought about going overseas? Have you ever thought about going on a freighter boat? What, what areas do you like? Where would you like to be when you grow up? And then from that, I have a little bit of an idea where they want to go. Some people say, I don't know. Their parents haven't told them, haven't ex- expressed anything to them like mine did. Mine didn't say, do you, where do you want to go? I just knew it from the spirit where I wanted to go. Uh, but with the kids, I've made a dent in their minds, according to the parents, that, oh, you opened up a door. And I thought, that's great. That's what I want to do. Let's open a lot of doors. Anybody can do what they want to do, it, anything they want to do, but you've got to have a good purpose and why you want to do it. It can't be willy-nilly. And people don't have that purpose today. I'm trying to say, get into math, get into uh, electronics, get into <clears throat> engineering. Don't be fiddling around with something that's not going to take you anywhere. Thank you very much for having me come, and it was great to be with you.